Welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon, where the best ideas win. You're listening to a show that is all about ideas, about the search for wisdom and knowledge through conversation. My guests all have something to say and have the credentials to say it persuasively. Here, the conversation continues. Thank you for joining me for the latest episode of the Optimistic Curmudgeon. Excellent. Welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon, where the best ideas win. I'm your host, Josh Herring. Today, my guest is Dr. Daniel Pitt, a scholar at the University of Sheffield with an interest in the Conservative Party, conservatism, and constitutional affairs. I met Daniel at the Action University Conference this past June, and we struck up a great conversation. Daniel, welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon. Brilliant. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Well, it is so exciting to uh, get to pick up our conversation today. I know uh, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, getting to meet you and uh, find out about some of your your research interests. Um, before we get into Roger Scruton and everything there, uh, tell us a little about yourself. Uh, what do you do? Where do you live? And how on earth do you style your amazing mustache? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take I'll take the the latter bit first. Um, little anecdote. Um, I, when I was teaching some undergraduate students, I, I went through the module. This is what's going to be going. We're going to be doing in the year. Any questions? I normally expect hardly any. Hardly any hands go up. Loads of hands went up. Okay, first question about my moustache. Second question about my moustache, and I said, "Okay, has anyone got a question that's not about my moustache?" All the hands went down. Yes. <laughs> so, so um, actually, actually, one person asked a question about my hair. That how do I dye my hair this grey? And I said, "I don't. It's natural." But um, <laughs> yeah, I think the moustache is one of the best kept secrets. To um, but what, what do I do? Um, I live in Derbyshire in the East Midlands of England. Um, I currently um, teach at the University of Sheffield, which is in the north of England. Um, I teach there from uh, political theory, British politics, um, a little bit of political economy, um, these sort of things. Just going to be teaching British politics module this coming uh, semester, this new academic year. Uh, my main research interests focus on, like you've already said in the introduction, conservatism as a whole, um, un trying to understand what it is, um, looking at the tensions, dilemma, these sort of things. Also, from a historical perspective, the Conservative Party from 1832 Reform Act, essentially when party politics came into, um, into for being, and also when British politics became national rather than essentially local competition. Um, and then, of course, a part of that is another es aspect of mine is constitutional affairs um, in Britain, um, especially, but also in like Commonwealth countries which have a similar type of constitution like Australia, New Zealand, and of course, the United States as well. There is so much in there. I, I, I've been fascinated by intellectual <laughs> conservatism, uh, really, ever since undergrad years at Hillsdale College. I just found that ah. uh, met a lot. I had a lot of professors who had drunk deep at the well of Russell Kirk and mm. uh, William Buckley and Edmund mm. Burke, T.S. Eliot. Uh, so I, I find that all fascinating. Uh, so I'd love if you could take a second and uh, at, at to to whatever length uh, you want. If you're going too long, I might I might jump in, but uh, how would you define conservatism in the sense of a, a movement, in the sense of something international, in the sense of something very English? Um, what is conservatism? Wow, big question. Well, <laughs> there is a big debate about what it is. Um, is it a disposition? So an Oakeshottian, and Michael Oakeshott way disposition, the familiar um, gradual change. So it's, it's an attitude of mind, this type of definition of conservatism, that um, where, where there is a debate about uh, how far can you move away from this? For example, Roger Scruton, who we, we'll move on to talk about, who is my um, postgraduate uh, tutor, um, he would say, yes, there is a, a dispositional element, but there's a, a large P, capital P element to it as well, which which is of course comes from Hugh Cecil's book from early 1900s. 
Um, people on the left have tried to say it's an ideology, but of course, conservatives define ideology different from a Marxist would. Um, Robert Nesbitt said that it is an ideology, in a sense, using that term as an ideology is a worldview. That is a, a way of looking at the world, a life orientation, um, rather than a systematic, all telling, all dancing way of, of, of a guidebook towards where you're going. Um, so, and then there's the debate about that is there a principled aspect of conservatism or is it merely a defense of the status quo, essentially a substantive version of it, which is, has principles and the conservatives will advocate X in an. Uh, why context, or there's more a procedural aspect where it's all about gradual change, and then conservatives can be conservatives in any status quo, then you could be a conservative in a socialist economy, for example. So it's, it's extremely contestable of what conservatism is um, within the literature. So it's actually very difficult. There's no one Mm. Uh, canonical text that you can go to and say read that and you'll understand conservatism as a whole you have to as you said a moment ago in your question you've got to uh, drink deeply you've got to bathe in the well you've got to swim about a bit there's no one place where you can say look jump in here and you'll be done so you've got to read many different sources uh, to, to have a, a wider overview of what conservatism is I think that's a really helpful way to think about it. I was I had a, a student at Thales College last week ask me to uh, describe the contemporary political scene in America, and particularly he wanted to know what exactly is this thing called the new right. And uh, uh, first off, I was kind of like, well, this is exciting because I'm I'm moving from teaching high school students where it's 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 very difficult to have uh, truly political discussions with high school students because they can't vote yet mm. and they are just echoing their parents views and if you make a misstep in that conversation you can get some very angry parent emails uh, but yeah. with college students it's a totally different ball game and I went back to something that I found helpful about eight years ago when I tried to answer this question and I, I drew my uh, big horseshoe diagram and had kind of <laughs> the left and the right and I started putting different groups like here's traditional conservatism here's like mm. progressivism Here's the American Democratic Party. Here's the neocons and the GOP. And before I, by the time I finished, I looked at my horseshoe and thought, this is not at all a helpful diagram. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> have like eight different intersecting groups that are all defined in opposition to each other. And some of them have positive views of things. And some of them are former leftists who just rebranded and tried to say they're now rightist. And is it yeah. a, rightist a thing? I don't really know. And, mm -hmm. we're in that, and, and the new right fits in there somewhere. All that to say, I, I think that anytime we're getting into this, how do we even define a political movement? I, it, it gets mm. to be so complicated that there's, mm. my sense is that most times students want a simple answer. Yeah. The answer mm. is never nearly as simple as they want. The answer is really, well, here, let me hand you six books. Go read these. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about them. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And there's, the, the pop, the, there's a definitional problem with the new right, because in the British literature, the new right means Reagan and Thatcher. And now we've got a new we've got a new right, which means, of course, post-liberalism uh, and, and that new growing. So it, it, I wrote for the University of Bookman on a on a, um, a review of another book. But at the end, I wrote that it's a critique of the it's the new new right, which is a, or the or critique of the old new right, which is very, very frustrating in that sense. So yeah, the, the old right would be some would like be the 1960s conservatism, mm -hmm. um, where the new right was Margaret Thatcher and Reagan. So now we have another new right, just like we have a, a new conservatism group uh, in in Britain. A uh, new one just came up, Danny Kruger, MP, and uh, others. And in 1920s, round Stanley Baldwin, we also had a new a new conservatism as well. So we seem to have new right, new conservatisms uh, coming along multiple times, which makes things even more complicated. 
Well, and, and certainly, I mean, I think uh, one of the things I appreciate so much about uh, reading Roger Scruton is that he he manages to simultaneously demonstrate an appreciation for all the ways this conservative disposition has manifested in previous generations, and yet mm. uh, maybe to uh, to to steal from Homer for a second, to, he sings the song again in our time. He seems to be writing mm. about a a conservatism that's that's rooted but is fresh. Uh, so maybe we can bridge over to uh, talking about Sir Roger for a moment. Um, I know you mentioned a second ago that he was your your tutor uh, in, mm -hmm. in uh, graduate school. Um, mm -hmm. Walk us through some of that that connection. Uh, how did you first encounter Sir Roger? Uh, what what did, had you read his books before you studied with him, or did y'all just kind of meet in person? What what was that like? So first of all, um, my original studies were um, in business economics. Um, international business. So I did an undergraduate degree, bachelor, then I did a master's degree in international business. And I, I thought, this is all great. I've got all this knowledge about uh, business practices, how the economy works. It, it wasn't, I thought, where are my other values that I come into? Where do this other debates come in? Where does the idea of marriage sit in with, with HR? human resource policies and so on. Um, where does the family come in? Where does this? So I wanted a more rounder education after that. Books about conservatism. And I can't remember which one was first, but I, I remember the first three that I read. It was Roger Scruton's The Meaning of Conservatism, mm. uh, Russell Kirk's The Conservative Mind, and then Edwin Burke's um, Reflection on the Revolution in France. They were the first three that I read. Um, I can't remember whose was first. Was it Kirk's or Scruton's? I couldn't. Remember, be a conservative, um, and I just thought this is this is wonderful. I agree with so much of this. I, I it was quite it was amazing how much I could agree with something that I've never read before. Hmm. It was it, it was quite a. this um so i read his work for about three four years and i thought right i'm going to contact him uh i'm going to send him an email and these sort of things and then i signed up when i realized that he was teaching at the university of buckingham he was doing an ma even though i already had a master's degree i thought right i'm going to go and get another one <laughs> but this time in <laughs> philosophy and i'm going to be taught by R roger scruton i thought i've got to i got to do this so i signed up and I went along and I think that was in 2017, 18. Mm. Um, so I first met him in a little uh, old Georgian Bloomsbury house down in the basement. Um, I went there and he said, hello, Daniel. And I thought, oh, gosh, it's, he knows my name. <laughs> Oh, uh, but he was you're back he was yeah i'm back so nope. he was he was he was he was lovely and that was the first time i met him and the other staff member who was later on roger's research assistant samuel hughes um he was also there he was very much involved with dr samuel hughes now um in in that whole teaching of that of that master's degree so you read his books fell in love with his ideas and then found the opportunity to actually study with him yeah exactly that's yep. exactly what i did and it was it was down in london uh, even though it was at the university of buckingham it was a london program wow. and we were in the pall mall which is where all the the, the, the gentlemen clubs are and uh, from the 18th, 18th century onwards and we were in the the Reform Club, which is ironic, really, because the Reform Club was the headquarters of the Liberal Party originally. And in the loos there, they've got all the cartoons uh, degrading all Tories 
from all the old magazines, punch magazines and so on. So it was interesting. One time, Roger and I were there at the same time and we were just giggling and uh, laughing at that, that there were two Tories in the reform club um, and there were all these pictures denigrating Tories. So that was... That, that was quite something. And of course, we were taught down in the downstairs in the basement. I'm sure that wasn't on purpose because there was a big picture of Gladstone over <laughs> the top of the table where we were going. And I'm much more of a Disraeli man, as you can see the picture behind me. So oh, okay. that was that that was quite something. Now, let me ask you a couple questions about that. Um, first off, help us with uh, what exactly it, you said the Reform Club. Uh, what what kind of you called that a gentleman's club? Help us with a bit more of what that means, because that does not have a positive connotation in in America. Oh, okay, uh, okay, I don't think no. you have the kind of club you're describing. So help our listeners know. Okay, what you're talking. Yeah, about. that that was yeah. It was not. It's not a strip club. Put it that way. Um, but a, gen a gentleman's club, uh, it's a private members club. Um, it was normally uh, it, when it was first, they originally were for the aristocratic upper class mm. men um, to wine, dine, socialize and network. And when political parties first came about in the UK, these were the manifestations. This is where the headquarters of these parties came before they became more independent. The conservative okay. one was the Colton Club. Uh, so again, a, a gentleman's club, private members club, um, and get along like at Disraeli or or Salisbury or before you had to become a member of these clubs. So you had to become a member of the Colton Club if you really wanted to progress with the Conservative Party or the Reform Club of the Liberal Party. Um, and then when the parties became more organised and they had that of the clubs of these clubs. So try and imagine suits, you had to wear a suit, tie, uh, sh uh, shoes, um, newspapers, Victorian reds, golds, greens, busts of all the greats. That's that's the type of club I'm talking about. Oh, well, I mean, it just, in, in one sense, it's hard for me to imagine, but I feel like I've seen this in lots of movies, but so yeah. your, your studies with Doc, with Rod, Sir Roger were not, you're not meeting in a classroom. You are no. sitting down in armchairs, perhaps with, I, I'm imagining pipes and cigars as part of <laughs> the, just the atmosphere, maybe, maybe mm. someone bringing drinks as y'all are discussing. Yes. And it's just yeah. a rip roaring conversation and, and everyone is just a feast for the mind and, and the body. Is that, is that, mm. is that, is that the atmosphere? Am I, am I imagining that correctly? You are, apart from there was no no tobacco, oh, no okay. cigarette, those sort of things. But the first part would be uh, there were there was around 13 of us um, and Roger would invite guests who would come along. Roger would stand at one end of the table. He would deliver a, about a 40 minute lecture. Um, so there would be no PowerPoint slide or anything like that. Uh, and then there would be the guest uh, so another eminent person, for example, um, Professor Anthony O'Hare was there, another prominent conservative um, and others. Uh, we would adjourn next door. We would have a glass of wine uh, or two. Roger would always order more. Uh, and then we would go back to the original room and that would be laid for dinner. And there would either be a two or three course dinner and over dinner, then there would be the seminar. And that would be about an hour and a half talking um, minimum. If Roger was really on form and he ordered plenty more wine, that would continue. <laughs> and then we were sat in, in many chair, wing back chairs and so on. So it was the educational and it's still like that, I'm told, today as well at the University of Buckingham and these London programmes. So it, it is a brilliant way. But Roger always would order more wine and he would insist that he chose the wine too, which, of course, I, I drink, therefore I am. So we were going to a, we were going to allow him to do so. And, and I assume that I mean, so what 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 was Roger like as a person? I mean, you're, you're describing 
This, the, he does not sound like a stodgy professor who's just always deep in the books. This, he sounds very lively the way you're describing him. Yeah, well, th there were multiple Rogers as far as I'm concerned. There was the, the spiky Roger, as his uh, now widow Sophie referred to him in the 1980s. He, um, he was much more very angry at the left for the way that he was treated and um, um, so, but he mellowed. So I got the mellow Roger. He was much more mellow when I met him, but he was very witty, very dry wit. He would change. When I first got to know him, he was very formal. Um, he was very reserved. And a couple of, about six months, nine months in, you, he, you, he, he, he changed. He became much more softer, more mellow, more, more jovial, um, these sort of things. So I think that if you only had a briefing meeting with Roger, you would have a different view of him. Mm -hmm. um, I, that's quite similar to me, actually. Um, in, when you first meet me, I can be quite, I'm working you out before I start then opening up. And that was the same with him. Um, but yes, definitely. He was a man of action as well. He contemplative life was drawn to him, but the active life too. Uh, he was active in the 1980s in underground universities and undermining communism in Czechoslovakia, uh, Poland, Hungary. He was active in setting up a magazine, the Salisbury Review. Um, he was active advocating things. He set up the, the conservative philosophy group which met in London still does um, so he was very active as well so he had these two aspects to him the contemplated life in books but also the active life I think that's been quite usual with conservatives since Burke really that the idea of that you build this beautiful ship and keep it in dock forever rather than go out and sailing it so um, there's these two aspects of, of Scruton I think that's really interesting because I remember when I did the uh, seminar at Macosta, we focused a lot on uh, Russell Kirk's view of conservatism. I think he would be probably more on the dispositional end of the spectrum you described earlier and seeing mm -hmm. conservatism more as that disposition. And at one point, uh, he wrote a book that was titled A Program for Conservatives that uh, people snapped up only to discover that uh, what Kirk called a program was really a book length description of that that disposition and that way of life. And his yeah. way of being an active conservative was to live in Macosta and be very hospitable with his home. And that's that's really what he saw as the proper action for conservative. So mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting to be able to put that that contemplative side and that scholarly side together with a a very active concern for really what what should our way, our our communal way of life look like, and mm. I know um, Scruton is the only conservative that I've read who has very strong views on uh, something as mundane as. And I don't mean to be disrespectful to architecture by calling it mundane, or to urban planners by calling them mundane, uh, but mm. Scruton had very very strong views on the way cities ought to be laid out, and that mm. if we're going to mm. organize life for certain ends, then the the way the city should be structured should facilitate those ends rather than make it more difficult. And I think that's mm. something that American conservatives don't really pay nearly as much attention to. Uh, but but I wonder if that's a place where that contemplation, that action kind of joined in, in Scruton's thought. Yeah, well, I, you're absolutely right to point that out with Scruton. That was it. Actually, Scruton, he first didn't come. He, he was a philosopher of, uh, of aesthetics. Mm. first. That's what he was a professor in rather than politics. Um, and then his big book in 1980, which I already mentioned. Quick, there we well, go. I'm beauty. Sorry. Very short introduction on beauty. It's a, it's a short book, but big ideas, and it's difficult to read. It takes time. You've got to absorb it and take it in. Um, his his let we had about ten lectures on ten different topics with Scruton, and by far the most passionate was when we came to aesthetics. We had metaphysics, uh, we had aesthetics, we had politics, we had all of, all of these. Um, with Actually, you mentioned Russell Kirk. Russell Kirk wrote on architecture too. Oh. Um, so, uh, um, 
But I think you're right that um, American conservatives definitely, I think the American conservative magazine for a while had Scruton write for them. And he wrote about urban planning. And I think this was a really important um, aspect of where American conservatives can learn from Scruton. Uh, um, just to quote Winston Churchill, um, Churchill thought that we shaped our buildings and then our buildings then shape us. Mm. So the place where we live, where we dwell, where we eat, where we sleep, where we meet with others, where we meet with the stranger, all impact on us because it's in our everyday, they shape us. Mm -hmm. So we shape them originally and then they shape us too. And even you can see that the way that streets are built, the way we walk down streets, the places where we can meet, where we can talk. Uh, if we wish to, um, this communal trust, where can we build this communal trust? Where can we come out of our private and into the public and commune as citizens? So this was deeply important uh, to Roger and his, his view on art, his view on architecture and the view of politics all come into one with architecture. He saw it as a architecture is, is, is political. It has a political aspect, but it's an art and it's an art that we all have to live with. Your neighbor may build something that he or she thinks is pretty fantastic. And we may think it's ghastly and we have to live with it. But a painting that you hang in your living room, that person only has to live with it. Perhaps mm the spouse and their children, but it, it's, it has a public, it's a public, has a public impact for positive or negative. So I think this is really important, the sort of how do we live with each other uh, and in the buildings that we live live in. I think the, the book of his that I've read that makes that argument most clearly was his, uh, I think it's his 2010 Gifford Lectures collecting into mm. the face of the world. And I just, mm. I cannot look at skyscrapers the same way after reading <laughs> his lectures, because he makes this fascinating argument about the way that the building is oriented outward. And he, he starts this with ancient Greece and the temple, and the idea that the temple was originally constructed to represent the god looking and speaking outward to the world. And so mm -hmm. as, the, as the, the petitioner is approaching the temple, even that approach is a conversation with the God. And then he mm -hmm. jumps to this contrast to the modern faceless skyscraper that mm -hmm. is stripped away. And he walks through all these architectural elements that I, I don't really remember or understand to a great degree. But I, I imagine an architect would. But he describes classical mm. architecture as having all these pieces that would create this sort of dialogue with people as they approach the piece of architecture in contrast to modernism that conscientiously stripped all of that away in order to build at giant scale using steel and glass. Mm -hmm. And so he, he talks about literally the facelessness of these buildings. And since I read that, I've, I've been in several large cities and in various downtown centers. And it's pretty <laughs> rare that I'll see a perfect example of the faceless building. Instead, there's usually some attempt. It's as if the architect can't quite bring himself to do a truly non-communicative building. Uh, there's usually some attempt to like bring some classical elements in, but at the same time, it, it doesn't have nearly the same effect as seeing a piece of classical architecture that has the entablature and the columns, and it frames it such that there is this face looking out as if like I am invited to be in the in the building space through the very structure itself. And I, mm -hmm. I just thought that's such a fascinating argument. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I, I think that's great. Um, and, and the way that buildings make you look up as well, and the way that they they are, are meant to be a connection, a part of of the surroundings, how they they meant to make you feel at home, you're part of somewhere. Many of these faces, are, they're faceless, they are nowhere. You could be anywhere. These, these buildings could be in Sydney, Australia. They could be in Dublin, Ireland. They could be in, in, um, in any, any place, pick them up, drop them. There's, there's no local building materials. There is, there is there, the Cotswolds, for example, in, in, in England, which Roger um, loved and also Russell Kirk uh, loved as well. Um, he, uh, Ford's museum about, you know, he picks up all these different buildings, build them all into one bit, 
museum and Russell Kirk said his favorite one was the Cotswolds cottage. And he said of the 1500s, um, because it was, it was beautiful. And you could also not just being beautiful, but also you could see it was from somewhere, that particular stone that was used. You can see that the, the craftsman's hand on it. Um, so it, 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 it it embeds you in place and to use Scruton's phrase, it's, it, it provides oikophilia, provides this, uh, this love of home. Oikophilia. I don't, that's a, that's a great phrase. I love that from the, uh, the oikos and the philos, the, the lover of home, love of home. That's, that's fantastic. Um, exactly. Well, Daniel, let me ask you this. I know I, Scruton was the, a prolific writer, and I have not by any stretch been able to read through the corpus of his published writings. Um, but I, I imagine you've read several of them, if not all of them. Uh, which of his books have you found most helpful? And uh, maybe this may be a different uh, different kind of book, but which have you most enjoyed reading? Oh, oh, that's that that the enjoyment. That one's the most difficult to answer. Um, I haven't read all of them because people debate if it's between 50 or 60 books he's written. So <laughs> if I, I, I could, I could just try and read Scruton for the rest of my life and still, and still struggle to do it all as well as having to read everything for, um, for, for the teaching and research and so on. But mm -hmm. I've, I've read a, a good whack. Um, the, for me, because I'm interested in politics first and foremost, um, I, I, is political writings are the ones that's informed me the most. So the meaning, the meaning of conservatism, which pu first published in 1980, um, how to be a conservative. Particularly happy. With it, um, it'd probably be the truth in different different works. So I think that's because he goes through the truth in liberalism, truth in socialism, truth in conservatism. So it's a, it's a great book in that way. Um, then, uh, actually, a funny little anecdote. I was reading, and I know that Josh, you've read this one too, Sexual Desire, and my other <laughs> you got a copy of it there. There we go. There yeah, so I had I had that next I had that next to my my TV, and a friend of mine came in <laughs> came into my flat at the time, and he just saw that you know the spine sexual desire, and he said to me, "What are you reading? What is that? Why have you got pornographic uh, content next to your TV?" I said, "It's not. Have a look at it." And he goes, "There are no." Said, yeah it's a philo philosophical treatise on sexual desire you know all right then put it back down again so that was <laughs> so, so yeah that, <laughs> yeah exactly so i don't know what he was expecting of me so um, that, that was that was probably one of the funniest but on human nature He died, Princeton University Press, uh, and I got him uh, to sign it for me um, to Daniel. Best wishes, Roger Scruton. Yes. And he asked me what he asked me why why this one, and I I'm really interested um, in the idea of sacred obligations about piety, and mm. in this. He was going to return it to this, and it was something that I wanted to do as well. And I didn't do it in my MA dissertation in the end, but he was very, 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 this is something he thought was absolutely fundamental to conservatism, which is this idea of that you have unchosen obligations. Mm. This is what, this is a fundamental difference from liberalism. Liberalism uh, believes that every single choice that you make is, should be voluntary, and if it is voluntary, it's more binding than if it's not. Uh, and if it's not binding, uh, if it's not been voluntary, you've been forced to do so. And you need to be freed from these shackles. Um, and Roger, through his mentor, um, 
John Casey, came to write that this was fundamental conservatism, that conservatives understand that you have unchosen obligations, but not just that you have them, but they're most likely to be the most profound obligations you ever come across. For example, you didn't choose your parents, you didn't choose your country, you didn't choose the city to grow up in or to be born into. Uh, so when you are born, you're born with patterns of, and within a network of obligations straight away, which you didn't choose. But those are the most profound. And you're probably born into a religion too. Mm -hmm. Let's say the Anglican or Catholic or whatever it may be, Jewish um, religion. And these are your relationship with God. These sacred obligations will be the most profound. Um, so this was something that I was really, really interested in when I was with Roger. And I think this is what made him find our conversations more fascinating because he said that it was very rare that he came across people who were interested in such ideas and the concept of piety. So that that one, I would say, is, is the most profound one for me on human nature. Probably not the most enjoyable mm -hmm. Um some of his writings, sort of his more journalistic stuff, literally makes me laugh out loud. I think The Rising Tide, which is the edited version of his journalistic works, um, with, a, I think, a, um, an introduction by Mark Dooley, um, that they're the best for, for most enjoyable because they're journalistic. Sometimes they're not as highbrow as you expect from him. Um, uh, the, the reasons why you should eat meat, these sort of things. They're, they're the most enjoyable to read. I want to go back to that idea of unchosen obligations for a second, because I think that is really interesting. I was thinking of, uh, you mentioned the family, the nation, um, the divine. I mean, and even, mm. I mean, even if we, which, and the religious question gets kind of tricky, because then, of course, you get you can be born into a religion and eventually come to the conviction that a different religion is true or is more true mm. and mm. but regardless every human is born if 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 something higher than humanity created everything that exists mm. then we do inherit some obligation about how do we relate to that higher being uh which and to 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 uh quote uh, aquinas which all men call god <laughs> I mean, that, so I, mean, that, I think there's something really that's that's really profound. I think it. Uh, I was listening to. Um, uh, I watched the recent uh, Republican nomination debates here in the United States this week, and yes, uh, yes. they, of course, one of the big questions that came up was was how would each candidate handle the question of abortion, and I mm. think that too is a. Uh, there's a sense in which uh, most cases of uh, unwanted, unplanned pregnancy or involve some level of choice. Not all of them do, but I wonder if that idea of unchosen obligation even comes in there, that there that, that could be a way to articulate, even if the mother had no choice there, there is still some obligation to the life within her. I mean, mm. that, there's, that, that idea of an unchosen obligation is, is really critical. And I, I love the yeah. way you articulated that 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 just seems to fit really well with uh, one of my favorite bits from Edmund Burke about the the love of the little platoon as we kind of grow up mm. in these small communities. But even as we we grow up and we make choices about where we're going to live and how we're going to live and what we're going to do, uh, we're still shaped by all of those things. And because we're shaped, we have some obligation to to care for those those communities. Uh, I mean, this, this even goes back as far as the, I think the, the fifth commandment. I mean, the honor your father and your mother that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. But there's, mm -hmm. there's that primal piety uh, that Socrates is trying to get Euthyphro to understand is something more than just what the gods say it is. There's right. something mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. real there that we all experience. Uh, that, mm -hmm. That's just, I got to mull that one over. That, that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, um, that's really good. Richard Weaver also has a chapter in his Ideas of Consequences on Piety. Um, I've, I'm editing a book on called Post-Liberal Turn and the Future of Conservatism. It's actually with the, the publisher now. Um, my chapter is on the environment and, um, and poetics and imagination. And one of the chapters I have is on piety and how this relates to our understanding and relationship with uh, the environment that we're in so from being the 
the built urban area, the countryside and our environment generally. Um, so I also use Richard Weaver in that for for that. So he's got a good, good, good chapter in his in his book. Again, another person who hated his this <laughs> title of his book. He didn't want idea um, 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 either. He didn't want that. But it's a great title, but he didn't like it. No, and his publisher was right. It, it has sold. And I, I love that book. That was one of the first books I read after college that I could not read quickly. That was another one I had. It took me about a year mm. to read Ideas Have Consequences. Yes. And then another two years to read Visions of Order. It just, just they, they're just, it's mm. just so weighty. I could read about four or five pages until I felt like I was, all right, I just have to let this mull over and I had to come back to it. Uh, but he's, I'll, I'll drop that line. And people who've never heard of Weaver are like, yep, I get it. Ideas do have consequences. Do I want to read about ideas? No, but I understand that ideas have but, consequences. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, my goodness. Well, uh, Daniel, I know we we initially connected over uh, a mutual admiration for for uh, Sir Roger, and uh, his his passing a couple of years ago struck me as the the death of a giant. I'm I'm not sure we're going to see his like again. I think he mm -hmm. he was he may have been the last uh, I don't know what the right term is the last gentleman scholar. Uh, I, I don't know that people are getting the same formation that he received today. Uh, but what has been the scholarly consensus around? Sir, uh, around Scruton's work, uh, or is there even a consensus? Uh, but what 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 have people made of his work in the couple of years since his passing into eternity? He he was a, a giant of his time, and a, 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 people refer to him as our our days Edmund Burke, and I, I would probably go that far as well. I wouldn't say that was over the top. There have been some greats. Um, um, in in conservative thinking, uh, but definitely in British conservatism, I think Roger is 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 at at, at the at the top of that 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 uh, that pyramid. Of course, there's there are greats that he relied upon, uh, not always in the conservative tradition. For example, Immanuel Kant, um, he more of a liberal. He didn't agree with him on 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 some of the cosmopolitan stuff, but. The categorical imperative about treating people as as a as an end rather than a means is very influential on Roger. Um, Hegel as well. People think of him as the influence on Marx, but of course Hegel is also uh, has a very much a conservative side, which was Roger was very much influenced by uh, the idea of that the importance of the family, uh, civil society, the role of the state. Um, so he, Roger was, of course, building on the tradition that already existed, and he put his own flavor onto it as well through his own learning. He would never take anything essentially from authority, which is a bit of an uh, unconservative way of doing it. You had to think about it. And if he came around, T.S. Eliot was another one um, who he admired greatly, but he also admired people on on the left, such as um, such as uh, Orwell, in his one of his later books in um, the State of Britain Today, I think he cites Orwell more than anyone else. Um, I think it will be difficult to have another Roger Scruton. I don't know about ever again because I think that's 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 too big a thing to say. But at the moment, I, there is a big big hole left where where he he he's gone in British conservatism. There's a big big hole. Um, there are are some younger conservative scholars coming through, but it's hard to be in the academy and be an open conservative, um, which many, especially in Britain, it is. As, uh, um, so, uh, of course, Roger left the academy and then went back to it again. Um, Russell Kirk, who we've always mentioned, he was never particularly in it properly, uh, but kept going back to do lecturing positions and and so on. So I do think if you are, if you are going to be a, a, a it, whoever it would be, a big conservative figure, a scholarly figure, is that you have seem to be you have to be half in, half out. Um, but that's probably the case with any public intellectual, really. Um, but yes, there is a big gaping hole where a big Roger Scruton gaping hole in, in conservatism at the moment. 
Uh, it's it, well, time time will tell. Uh, if if anyone kind of if there if there is a next person, we'll 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 find out about that over time, I suppose. Um, I wonder if we could uh, as we kind of wrap up. Uh, we we've, we've mentioned Russell Kirk and Roger Scruton and and even Richard Weaver in our conversation today. I know you were recently at Macosta uh, studying the work and life of Russell Kirk. Um, mm. How well would you see the ideas of Scruton and Kirk cohering? Are they are they at odds with each other? Do they have opposing views, or do they really cohere well and seem like two different two people working towards the same ends from different angles? Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely the latter. They they are definitely they're def they're traditionalists in their own country. So when I'm over in the U.S., when I was with you, Josh, uh, in Grand Rapids, I call myself a Kirkian conservative. Um, when I'm in Britain or Europe, I call myself a Scrutonian conservative. And for me, I mean exactly the same thing. Hmm. So I, I think they can hear very well. Of course, um, to a certain extent, they would probably have differences on such things. Monarchy, for example, um, even uh Kirk, when he came over to Britain, he was very family friend, friendly with families like uh, aristocratic families. Uh, so he wasn't adverse to hereditary principle um, in any stretch of the imagination. Um, uh, you, most of his people he he wrote about and how and aristocratic families. He writes positively about the Has Has Hasburgs as well in his autobiography. But yes, absolutely, they are very similar, um, indeed, very similar. Uh, Roger went over to Piety Hill in 1980s, the early 1980s, and there are two photographs of Roger Scruton uh, with Russ uh, in in the in the library. So, um, and I had a great conversation with Annette Kirk about Roger, they remember him fondly going over. Uh, Russell wrote a letter to the Heritage uh, Foundation, I can't remember who it was at the time, uh, saying that Roger Scruton, this is in a, a, I think a Bradley Fellowship. Um, so I think also Russell Kirk donated to Roger Scruton's um, Salisbury Review magazine mm. uh, to help him get that up and going. Um, so in the in the in the in the eighties and early nineties, there was a, a, a quite a relationship there between the two men, two men, um, a mutual uh, recognition of 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 each other. Scruton criticised um, Kirk a little bit. Uh, after his death for being romantic, a bit too romantic, especially when it came towards Britain. He said that Roger said that he had to deal with Britain as it is, where Russell mm -hmm. could have a, a sort of a romantic view of Britain. Um, actually, a little anecdote about that. Um, Roger also criticised me for being too romantic. <laughs> and he said, you get that from Kirk. You've got that from reading Kirk. You've got your romantic side from reading Kirk. And I thought, like, that's a compliment. I'm taking that. There I'm we go. That. Wow. So yes, Thanks. they were very, very, very complementary thinkers. The big, big, big difference between the two is that Kirk was more historical, and uh, Scruton was more philosophical mm -hmm. in their approach. And also, interesting, the criticism they have of each other is essentially the same. Roger thought that Kirk did not look enough at German philosophers like Kant and Hegel. Um, Kirk wrote himself he would much rather read Christopher Dawson than those two. <laughs> and the opposite was the same. Kirk said about Scruton that he was too much enamored with German uh, uh, philosophy and should read more <laughs> Christopher Dawson. So their, their, their criticism of each other was essentially the same, but the opposite, turned the opposite way. Oh, that's fantastic. I. No, I think the 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 romanticism is probably very fair, a very fair critique. I think uh, both Kirk and Weaver shared that in common to some extent. Mm. Uh, probably Weaver even more so than Kirk. Weaver had his uh, he he definitely had an idyllic view of uh, ant the antebellum South and was never mm -hmm. bothered by his mm -hmm. 
neo, I don't even know the right phrasing, but his modern Neoplatonism, like being completely impossible to logically prove. He wasn't <laughs> bothered by that at all. That didn't matter to Weaver. I mean, he just like, Look. he just, he was just all about the transcendentals. It doesn't matter if we, we never need to prove those. It's fine. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, I've never, I've never had the impression from reading, when reading Scruton that he is sort of making up an ideal. And, and I've had that with both Kirk and, and Weaver, uh, various mm. points. Yeah. Uh, and well, Kirk and Weaver, of course, were friends, of course, weren't they? They were, right. they were close friends and acquaintances. Uh, um, so were, I can, you I, can see see why. Yep, and uh, I just I love there's a uh, the introduction to uh, the ISI edition of Visions of Order. Uh, Kirk wrote the introduction to that, and he talks. It's the only place I've seen anything definitive about Weaver's um, theological status, and uh, mm. Kirk is not willing to affirm that Weaver was fully a Christian. Uh, he mm. he talks about uh, Weaver going to Episcopal church service once a year <laughs> and being yeah. so overwhelmed at the beauty that he would not come back for another year. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a great, that's a great line. I like there that. Never, uh, uh, anyway, that we could go on on that for a while. Uh, well, Daniel, mm. as we, as we start to wrap up, um, uh, do this for me. Uh, if, if hopefully in our conversation, we have intrigued some viewers and listeners to, uh, to go find some of the works of Roger Scruton. Uh, where would you direct somebody who had never read any Scruton before? Where where should people start if they want to read something by Sir Roger? Ah, okay. Um, the first place to go, I think, would be a great place to go is go to his website, the Roger, rogerscruton.com, something like that. Go there because there's a collection of his of his his essays, um, his articles, his journal, more journalistic stuff. I think that's easier to get into. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you would like to is politics go to uh, conservative an invitation to a tradition that's a slim book that's written for a wider audience that's a newer one I think it's 2017 mm -hmm. go there start with that one um, if you're interested in in his um, in his aesthetics the book that you showed a short a short introduction to beauty yeah there we go go there it's it's a short book but it's it's a difficult book. Right. If you want to know more about his environmental stuff, uh, Green Philosophy uh, is a great book, but it's 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 again, um, it's it's a it, it, there's lots of stuff in there to go to. And then I, I think that um, th th those two, those three would be excellent. And then if you want something to do with his view of England, uh, England and elegy. Um, that that's an excellent book. If you want to understand Roger's perspective on England, then go there. If you want something about theology, um, our church, especially if you're an Anglican, go there. If you're not an Anglican, go to um, the face of God. Mm -hmm. That was, I'll, I'll just second the recommendation for the face of God. It was amazing. I've never, I, I very rarely read a, read a collection of lectures and felt uh, spiritually moved towards worship from reading a collection of lectures. And that, that mm. happened in reading the face of God. It's, it's, it's just, it was beautiful. And you can, he, he is no less a faithful philosopher than he is a, a, I, I don't know exactly how to even classify his, his Anglican faith, but like it, there's very clearly a real faith that's, that's behind what he's writing, but he, he doesn't fit my American schema somehow. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's difficult to place us because um, some people, because people like Roger and I, who 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 come through our religion through bells, whistles, local ritual, beautiful English churches, essentially come at it through that perspective rather than theological yep. musings and and that underpinning, or by a sort of an, an evangelical go out preach the word, the gospel approach i think that's um and he lived in Macosta, so he he became a a catholic yep. and t.s Eliot, of course didn't go over to rome even though he said he was a a catholic anglo-catholic because his attack to the churches and right. um and the england churches and rituals and so on so
Um, the uh, the I, I've I've thought for a long time that the the way may be narrow, uh, but the kingdom is wide. <laughs> the uh, yeah, there's a there's yeah. a lot of room for God to draw a lot of different kinds of people to Himself for sure. Quite, um, quite, quite. Uh, well, Daniel, thank you for a wonderful conversation. Uh, where can people quite. find and follow your work online? Uh, but the best place is the, the place formerly known as Twitter on X. Um, my, yeah, you have to be careful about not saying the artist formerly named as Prince and symbols right? there. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, on Twitter is the best place to find me if you are interested in my political stuff. So at Dan J T Pitt, and then from there you can get my other stuff through LinkedIn and and Google Scholar. Um, but if you're interested in following any of my political, academic conferences, publications, I I always put them there first. Uh, you are a traveling a traveling man, that's for sure. And uh, <laughs> if I followed your post as correctly, I, I understand congratulations are in order because you just finished, you defended your dissertation recently. Am I, did I put that together yeah. correctly? Yeah, that was actually in January, oh. um, at the very beginning of the year. Yeah, time flies. Oh man, time flies. So that was that was about seven and a half months ago, which is unbelievable. So, but you did too, didn't you, Josh? You yours is recent. I did. We'll we'll just uh, we'll we'll count that as uh, 2023 is a very exciting year for uh, finishing yeah. major dissertation projects. It's uh, yeah. So I, I I submitted I submitted mine in November last year, okay. and then I defended it halfway through January this year. Fabulous. Well, a, a belated congratulations, Dr. Pitt. Since I did not know you in January, <laughs> I'll congratulate you. Today. <laughs> And um, congratulations to you, Dr. Herring. Ah, well, you're very kind. Uh, well, Daniel, thank you so much for joining me today for a, a conversation about the greatness of Sir Roger. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to another episode of The Optimistic Curmudgeon. My guest this episode has been Dr. Daniel Pitt, a scholar at the University of Sheffield with an interest in the Conservative Party, conservatism, and constitutional affairs. And he is a student of the late, great Roger Scruton. If you like this episode, please do leave us a five-star review and share it with your friends. Until next time, discover the true, seek the good, and love the beautiful. You've been listening to another episode of The Optimistic Curmudgeon. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button and share it with your friends. If you want to let me know what you thought about the episode, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Just search for The Optimistic Curmudgeon. Your host is Josh Herring. Madison Kay is our audio engineer. Until next time, seek the good, pursue the true, and love the beautiful.